welcome everyone again. I think we're ready to get going with 231 here. Thanks so much for using that chat box to send your greetings. Um, I know that we have, again, folks, it's great to see the list, Nebraska, Texas, Virginia, Nova Scotia, um, Michigan, Alabama, Pennsylvania, Vermont, California, New Jersey, Rhode Island. Wow, all over the place, Maine. Um, wonderful, wonderful to see you. And uh, we also have some, some folks joining us who aren't Harlow family descendants, which is wonderful because the Harlow story is a Plymouth story. And so if you have an interest in local history, this is a great, uh, you know, we always are glad to have you with us. And we have some Harlow cousins who aren't yet members of the Harlow Family Association, but it's been really fun this weekend to see you and to get to know you a little bit and talk with you. So I'm going to turn it over now that we are, we're at 2.32, so I think it's a good time to start. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Plymouth Antiquarian Society's president, um, Virginia Davis, who is known to many of you who've been able to make it to the Harlow House for the in-person reunions. She's usually there in costume, um, providing tours of the house, and she is one of our, or she is our lead docent at the Harlow House when it's open normally in the summer. So Ginny, I will turn it over to you to give your greetings to everyone. Well, hello all. And I don't even know where to begin because uh, I actually have a lump in my throat. I really miss being there and, and seeing some of you in person. But I was thinking about this today and I thought how wonderful in a way though that this is virtual meaning that people from all over the United States and perhaps even in other countries could really join um, you today. So um, I know Anne has a, a wonderful virtual tour waiting for you and you've had a tour of the house. And I so look forward to next summer being back there when we're all in person. But I greet all of you and um, I'm not a hollow descendant, but um, I love you all and um, stay well. And I look forward to seeing you all next summer and all of you who have never been there, uh, maybe plan to come to Plymouth and, and see this dear little house and see the other houses that we own and this beautiful town on Plymouth, on Massachusetts Bay. And our Mayflower has come back. So that's very exciting for the waterfront and for Patuxet Plantation or whatever their new name is now. So that's all for me. And, uh, have a wonderful tour and uh, have a wonderful rest of your conference. Thank you. Thanks so much, Ginny, um, for, for being here and saying hello to everyone. Um, and so if you want, you can stay on, Ginny, and you can see the tour if you'd like, um, or, or you don't need to, but I'm gonna stop your video so that you don't have to worry about people seeing you <laughs> during, the, during the presentation. Um, all right, so um, here, here we are. We, let's begin. And again, it's, it's a great privilege to be uh, able to share with you some of this Harlow family history. And when we were talking about what to do for this presentation, I think one idea I had was to actually uh, transport you virtually to Burial Hill in the heart of downtown Plymouth. Um, because the Harlow family has been in Plymouth for uh, a great many years, since the 17th century, there are quite a lot of historic Harlow gravestones um, in Plymouth. And I thought it would be interesting to visit them, to um, uh, see where they are, to highlight some of the iconography on the gravestones themselves, and then to um, just, just talk a little bit about other burial, burial places of Harlow descendants. Now, I will say that this is not going to be a tour that talks a lot about the individual people whose graves we're seeing. Um, we're going to, going to focus more on the graves as artifacts um, as opposed to uh, biographical records, but we will uh, dive a little deeper into uh, you know, the history of gravestones in, in New England and how they change over time. 
So for those of you who have been to Plymouth, I think you're probably pretty familiar with the location of Burial Hill. It was originally called Fort Hill because it's right where the um, pilgrims built their fort. It's a, a high place, <laughs> it's a hill, but it's still a high place right in the downtown area. And if you were to walk from the waterfront, up to Burial Hill, you would take what's called today Leiden Street, but was originally named just First Street. It's the first street in Plymouth along which the pilgrims um, built their houses. And people here in Plymouth have lived on that street ever since the 17th century. And I think it's one of the most remarkable things about Plymouth is we have this long centuries old history of people living in one place. And I apologize to those of you who are from Virginia because I always bring up the example of Jamestown, which of course the first settlement on Jamestown Island is now um, a park and it's a wonderful place to visit, but no one still lives in Jamestown. They all moved a little bit off of that island. Um, and so here in Plymouth, we're, we're really, um, it's quite special that we have that long history of, of the community right here. Now, if you have been to Plymouth Plantation, which um, is in the process of, of changing its name, so you may, may see it referred to as Plymouth, um, P-L-I-M-O-T-H, or sometimes as Plymouth Patuxet. So just be aware of that if you're, if you're planning a visit. But if you've been to Plymouth Plantation in the past, you will be very familiar with that one street going up the hill um, with the pilgrim houses on it at, at the top, the fort. Um, and so that's a re reproduction of what was right there um, on Leiden Street or Fort First Street in Plymouth. Um, and so where that fort was, is now Burial Hill. And I pulled up this map from 1846 where you can see on here the um, Burying Hill as it is called, uh, right really at the center of that map. You can see the different streets, uh, Main Street and Court Street, you can see a number of wharves stretching out into Plymouth Harbor, which all were demolished um, at the time of the tercentenary of the Pilgrim Landing in 1920 and 1921. Um, so now we just have a town pier and a state pier. Um, but you can also see Town Brook leading to some of the um, inland ponds in Plymouth. Um, and so we're right at the heart of Plymouth when we tour Burial Hill. And um, we know that there are very early burials there, but they're not all marked. So probably initially there would have been wooden grave markers that have since disintegrated. Um, maybe there were stone markers that also disintegrated or that for some reason were moved or lost. Um, so the oldest gravestone that survives dates from 1681 and it's the grave of Edward Gray. Um, and then gravestones of, or burials happened on Burial Hill right up until 1957. So when you visit Burial Hill, you're visiting really um, the full, almost the full history of settlement in Plymouth. And you're seeing people who lived in Plymouth over those uh, multiple centuries. And you can see the change in burial practices, in gravestone iconography and gravestone materials. Um, and that's, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a really wonderful place to visit. And it's a wonderful place for um, local historians and for genealogists because we do have those gravestones as, as a very special record. And, and so just to give you a feel of what it is like on Burial Hill, this is a, um, a 360 degree photograph that I took recently to um, just give you a sense of being on top of Burial Hill. Um, this is really the, the very, very top of the hill. You, um, if you're familiar with uh, with Plymouth and Burial Hill, you'll see this obelisk that I've moved to the center of your screen. That is the memorial to Governor William Bradford that was um, erected in the 19th century over the uh, presumed place of his burial, although there's not an original gravestone for him there, but there are Bradfords buried right there at the top of the hill. Um, and I'll just I'll pan around a little bit, but you do, you can see that beautiful Plymouth Harbor, um, this strip of land that's hidden by most of the trees there, that's Long Beach and Long Point. Um, out here, you can see an island off in the distance, that's Clark's Island, where the pilgrims um, had their first Sunday worship service at Pulpit Rock. Um, and so you get this beautiful, beautiful view on top of Burial Hill, and, and I can't strongly recommend it enough that if you come to Plymouth and have never been, um, you should definitely go. Um, so you can see, though, that we have a lot of gravestones here. 
Many of them are, are very close together. Uh, there are over 2,000 headstones that survive, and there were probably um, more burials, or, or there were most certainly more burials here that just um, the gravestones didn't survive. And so um, we're having a little bit of a, a, a glitch here where it's a little bit pixelated, I think. Um, maybe our internet is not loading as fast as it could, but that gives you a sense of, of what it looks like on top of Burial Hill. And so what I wanted, um, when I was starting to research for this presentation, I, um, you know, I was, I was looking at the, um, the, the, the wonderful history that, or genealogy that um, the Harlow Family Association has published, which is now sold out. We learned this weekend. So if you don't have a copy, um, you would probably start want to look at yard sales and online for used, used copies. But um, it's a wonderful resource because, of course, it provides information on the first early generations of the Harlow, descendants of William Harlow. Um, and it also provides information on where some of them are buried. So I will tell you that for the first generation, in terms of William himself and then his, his wives, his three wives, um, we do not know where they are buried. We presume that they could be buried on Burial Hill. It would make sense. Um, but we don't have gravestones for them. Um, but what I've, I have done is you can actually go on Find a Grave and all of the stones that I'm showing you are on Find a Grave um, and you can look up some of the second generation. So these are the children um, of Sergeant William Harlow. And um, it might surprise you that even in the second generation, we don't have surviving gravestones of William Harlow's descendants on Burial Hill, um, but we do have a few in other towns. Um, and so as we know, um, William Harlow had a number of children. They couldn't all stay in Plymouth. This happened with um, most uh, colonial families, you know, the different, different branches go out and settle other communities. Um, and so Rebecca Harlow, um, William's uh, daughter, married um, Isaac Cushman, and she is buried in Plimpton, Massachusetts. So you can find her gravestone and a lot of her descendants, Cushmans, are buried in that cemetery. Um, Repentance Harlow married um, uh, into the Lucas family and she's buried in Carver, Massachusetts, so that's her gravestone. And then Nathaniel Harlow is also in Plimpton, Massachusetts. So these towns are not that far from Plymouth. Um, they're just, um, just to the west, basically. Um, and and it's, it's where some of these later Harlows settled. And so if you have, if you are descended from any of those Harlows, you might want to look at those particular communities for, the, for their um, gravestones. We also, I forgot to mention that Joanna Harlow um, married James Barnaby and she is buried in Fall River. Um, and sometimes, as I'm sure you know from doing genealogy, it's hard to verify that the um, person that you're looking at their gravestone, it may not actually be the person that you're looking for. Um, and sometimes I will say that um, Find a Grave has errors on it. So I think it's a wonderful resource, but sometimes there might be um, a gravestone on there and they tell you it's one William Harlow when in reality it's a different William Harlow because William Harlow is a name that comes up a lot um, and so this is this is the um, you know it does not say this is Joanna Harlow who married James Barnaby but we um, some people believe that this is um, William Harlow's daughter um, so that's just something to keep in mind she's in Fall River and some of um, those descendants as well are in Fall River so let's go back to Burial Hill in here in Plymouth. And so if we don't have gravestones that survive for the first generation or the second generation, who do we have? Well, we have quite a number. We have some from the third generation. And what was interesting to me was that um, this, the children in the third generation were actually both sons of Samuel. So Samuel Harlow was the eldest surviving son of Sergeant William Harlow. Um, and so in the third generation, it's, it's his sons, William Harlow and John Harlow, who have gravestones in Plymouth. And those are the sons, that's, Samuel got most of um, his father's property in Plymouth. So it makes sense that his descendants would be the ones who stay in Plymouth, while the other um, children, their, their descendants, you know, are in other communities because their family moved. Um, I, I didn't um, show, I am not showing photographs of any of the 
Harlow family gravestones at the cemetery at the Green in Middleborough or Middlebury. Um, but there was a line of the Harlow family that went to Middleborough, just west of Plymouth, and there are Harlow gravestones there. Um, and I will say again, just as sort of a preliminary caveat, that it's much easier to find Harlow's who still have the surname Harlow. So um, most of the, the, you know, of course, if you're searching in on find a grave or you're searching on um, different online sources or print sources, um, it's easier to, tr to track the male surname. Um, sometimes women, their maiden name may not be on the gravestone. Um, and so then it's harder to find them. Um, so, you know, if you're, if you expand your search to look for Harlow descendants who don't have that Harlow surname, then you're, I mean, you're looking at a lot more people, obviously. Um, so here we have the grave, uh, the graves of William Harlow and his wife, Mercy Harlow. Um, and so William uh, died in 1751. Um, he was born in 1692. And just a couple of notes about these gravestones. You can see that they're encased in granite. So um, they are slate stones, but what happened um, in the 1930s, one of the early conservation techniques was to take slate stones and cut them off at the base. So um, to you know, dig them out of the ground and cut them off from their base and encase them in granite. And um, the theory here was that granite is a much um, more durable stone. So you could actually um, uh, use it to encase the slate, which um, would be very, very susceptible to um, erosion from, um, from rain, from snow, from ice. Um, what happens is that if you leave slate um, unprotected, the water can get in and create, their uh, slate has all sorts of um, sort of laminated layers that press together to form the slate. Um, and when you have water that gets in between those layers and it freezes and it expands and it can start um, splitting the layers apart and you have delamination, which can cause um, severe uh, problems for the preservation of these historic artifacts. So one, one conservation solution is, well, let's take the slate and encase it in granite, which will protect it. The only problem with this is that often by cutting the stones out of the ground, um, sometimes you would, they would actually cut off some, some um, information that might have been at the bottom of the stone. Often the stone carver might leave his initials um, you know, in the part of the stone that might be buried in the ground, and so you might lose that information. And the other thing is if you use um, a material like Portland cement to um, make sure the, the slate doesn't fall out of the granite, then you've introduced um, another element, um, and, and stone needs to be able to um, let water in and let water out, and if the Portland cement is keeping it from doing that, then it can just sort of create a new problem. Um, so this is an early conservation method used on Burial Hill, um, and you can see that these two stones are actually um, in, 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 in some rough conditions. There's a lot of lichen on them, so that makes it hard to read the inscriptions. Um, and then the stone for mercy is actually cracked in several places. Um, so again, um, it's, thankfully we have um, done a number of studies over the years that have documented inscriptions, um, photographed um, carvings so that those are on record. But um, it's, it's really difficult to preserve these artifacts because they're in this open air museum where, you know, again, with wind and water and snow and ice, they're just very, very um, fragile. And sometimes we don't think of stone as being fragile, but it is fragile. Um, so, so there we have these two stones. And I'm just going to take a pause and um, look at our questions, because we do have some questions coming in. Um, All right. So um, we had a question about where does one enter? And I think the, that means where does one enter Burial Hill, which is a great question. Um, let me go back to the map of Plymouth so that I can help orient those of you who are um, familiar with Plymouth. Um, we have, and I'm going to put on my little laser. So um, if you're down here, Plymouth Rock is down here, although the wharves are no longer there. And if you walk up Leiden Street, um, you come to Town Square, 
where there is um, what's now called the National Pilgrim Memorial Meeting House, which um, is um, being cared for and restored by the Mayflower Society. It's the large 19th century stone church. Um, and so right next to that stone church um, is a set of stairs that will take you right up to the top of Burial Hill. And so that's the main entrance. Um, if you continue off of Town Square is School Street. So there are another set, there's another set of stairs on School Street. Um, and also if you swing around, um, these streets are now one way, so you have to be careful about which direction you're going. But behind Burial Hill, off of um, South Russell Street, there is a parking lot. So that's a wonderful place to park and there's an access from there. Um, and then on the south side of, whoops, on the south side of Burial Hill, you have um, another steeper set of stairs that um, goes up behind the John Carver Inn. So that is, um, that's a great way to get up to the hill if you're looking for a workout, a little bit of cardio exercise. Um, so that's how you get in to the, um, into Burial Hill. Now let me just look at some other questions here. Um, uh, Rich is asking, how old is the great big tree in the last view to the right of the Bradford marker? Um, so that's wonderful. So in that panoramic shot of the top of Burial Hill, I did show um, what you could see large trees and most of them are beech trees. Um, and actually most of those trees date um, to the later part of the 19th century. So for most of its history, Burial Hill was treeless. Um, and, you know, again, this makes sense that in the early, in the earlier period, you would, um, you know, this was not seen as a park. Sometimes we, we um, are influenced by a 19th century idea of um, cemeteries as being more park-like and being more of a memorial garden and looking for a, a peaceful sanctuary setting. Um, and that, that's a 19th century idea. Um, and so that's when um, the paths were laid out. So those um, asphalt paths, paths that you saw, those are not original. They were not part of the plan. This was not a planned cemetery where they left room for people to um, pour walkways. Um, and this is not a planned cemetery where they um, had a landscape design where they would plant trees. Um, and so those trees over the years were, were planted. Some of them probably were volunteers. Um, and then a lot of times they actually would need to move gravestones in order to make room for those walking paths. And so when they did that, they were um, primarily thinking, yes, we want people to be able to move around the graveyard, but we also want people to, in particular, we know that people are going to want to go to certain areas of the graveyard. So, um, you know, they, they were thinking people want to see the memorial to William Bradford. So we want to make sure it's very easy to get to William Bradford. Um, so that's just, that's, it's a great question because it shows how the landscape has changed. So I don't actually know how big that, how old that um, big tree is, but it certainly dates from, um, you know, after the middle of the 19th century. Um, so um, there are a couple other questions that I'm going to come back to later in um, the in the presentation. So I'll I'll leave those for a little bit later. Um, and if let me check the all right here we go. All right, so um, let's go on. So we've looked at William, and again he's in that third generation of Sergeant William's descendants, um, and then his. His brother, John, is also buried on Burial Hill, and this is John Harlow's stone. Um, and so he died in 1771. I know that actually when someone registered, they specifically asked about John. Um, and so this is his stone. And I'm going to um, step back a little bit so that I can show you where these graves are that I'm talking about now. So um, in the first panoramic view that I showed you, we were at the top of Burial Hill looking out at the ocean where over near William Bradford's gravestone. Um, there are no early Harlows buried in that section of the cemetery. Um, actually, the, the earliest stones are over here near what is the Cushman Memorial. So if you're visiting Burial Hill, the Cushman Memorial is very easy to find because it's this huge granite obelisk. Um, bigger than the one to William, uh, to William Bradford. It's, it's very, very large. You can't miss it. Um, so if you walk over to that obelisk, you're actually going to be quite close to 
the first fort site. And so um, the, where, the center of your screen right now, that's where they think the original fort was built. And there's a sign there that marks it. So if you find the fort and you find the Cushman Memorial, all you need to do is turn around so your back is to the fort and to the Cushman Memorial. And it's in this area that we have some early Harlow gravestones. So this is a Harlow gravestone. Um, and then um, the one that I just showed you for John is over here. So you can see that we have a number of um, stones, you know, in, in these family groupings um, going down the hill. Um, and we also have some open areas. And if you look closely, you'll note that there are, um, unfortunately, some spots in the grass where there looks like there used to be a slate stone and it has broken off. Um, it could have been a footstone, but more likely it was a headstone that um, has, has not survived. And so sometimes you'll have a really um, well-preserved stone for one Harlow, and then you don't have the stones for his wife or for his children. Um, and they could still be buried here, but you just don't have that stone surviving. And again, this Cushman Memorial, which you can see takes up a lot of space. Um, there's a lot of asphalt around it as well. Um, you know, who knows what they had to move in order to build that um, in the 19th century. Um, so, so it's always, you know, it's, it's always a challenge to sort of find the remnants of all the stones that you might, might be looking for. So before we move away from Sam, uh, from William, and John, I just want to draw your attention to this, the beautiful carvings um, that are here on the headstones themselves. Um, and so we, when we're, we're looking at New England um, graveyards, we can see a lot of um, the same iconography that's used um, in different cemeteries, um, and it has some local and regional variations but you, you have some basic types that I want to, to talk about with you. And what I'll actually do is I'm going to go back um, to this, the stone of Joanna Harlow Barnaby. Um, and here you can see at the top of her stone, what we call a winged skull. Um, and it has, you know, this, it's very, it's kind of a, uh, a little bit of a, a it's not maybe not quite as realistic as a skull as you would see on other gravestones. Some skulls can be very realistic looking, um, but you can tell that that's a skull head with um, grinning teeth and then wings coming out of the skull. So this winged skull is um, is a symbol. We call it a memento mori or a reminder of death. Um, and this is not something that is supposed to be, it's not really a, a morbid reminder. Sometimes people go into historic cemeteries and they see skulls and they think, you know, Halloween and, and, and ghosts and being, you know, haunted. And that's not what, um, you know, the, the Plymouth or, or Puritan um, colonists were, were trying to convey. This is a, a, a reminder of death, a reminder that everyone will die. And so, um, you know, it's a reminder to the living who, who are looking at this stone um, that, you know, your time is short. And when someone dies, um, and, you know, of course, death was was very frequent in um, in the colonial period. Um, there, there, you know, death was a part of life. And that doesn't mean that it was any easier to lose a loved one. Um, but there was a different um, religious Christian worldview that saw death um, as a reminder of one's own mortality, as a reminder of one's own sin. And that if your life is short, you want to make sure that you're um, preparing yourself for death because it could come at any time um, to anyone. It could come to a child, it could come to a young person, it could come through um, disease, it could come through an accident. Um, and um, these, are, these are just symbols of that, um, that world of you. Um, and again, not, not to be um, creepy or morbid, but, but just to be realistic and to be aware of um, the soul's uh, readiness for death. Um, so that's, that's one type of, um, of, of iconography that you see throughout New England. But what we have here um, on William and Mercy stones, and then again on John's stone, um, you see that instead of a skull, you don't have a winged skull, you have a, a, a winged face um, that some people look at and say, well, that, um, that looks more like a cherub or an angel. Um, and often we refer to it as a soul effigy. 
Um, and a soul effigy is um, something that was, you know, we begin to see in the 18th century. So again, John Harlow died in 1771. Um, William Harlow died in 1751. Um, and so you have um, this, this sort of shift in worldview and religious conception of death. Um, and the focus is less on um, you know, someone saying, oh, I need to be reminded that death is coming, um, and instead being um, uh, sort of having this more hope, someone call it a more hopeful perspective that um, death is really the release of the soul, um, and at death, the soul is released and goes hopefully to heaven. So um, that's, it's, it's sort of more of a, an emphasis on the resurrection of the dead um, through, you know, salvation in Christ, um, then it is a reminder of death and um, sort of that more physical death. Um, so I'm just going to stop right there because I know we have some questions coming in. Um, and let me just see if I can answer them quickly. Um, and if you have, I see that a few people have raised your hand. So if you would like to, um, what I would say, if, you, if you've raised your hand because you have a question, if you could just use that Q&A um, function in that way, it's a little bit easier for me to, to navigate um, with everything else going on. Um, so one question came in, um, has ground penetrating radar been used to try and locate all the bodies buried on um, in this um, graveyard? Um, and so that's a great question because um, recently we have had uh, the good fortune of partnering the town of Plymouth and um, Plymouth Plantation has partnered with the um, uh, archaeological school at UMass um, Boston. And so the team is led by Dr. David Landon. Um, he's an archaeologist and he's been leading digs in Plymouth um, for the past uh, quite a few summers now. He's come back multiple summers um, leading up to 2020, um, and they were focused on Burial Hill because they were trying to find any um, remnants of the original Pilgrim settlement. They actually have made some exciting discoveries. They think they have found um, uh, uh, evidence of the original palisade for, this, for the colony, um, so that's been very fruitful. Um, and of course, they do um, bring radar and they're very careful not <laughs> to um, do an archaeological dig where there might be bodies. So they are, they've only been working on the outskirts of Burial Hill itself. Um, but more recently, um, there was a, one of the, one of the um, more well-known um, monuments on Burial Hill is to the sailors who perished in the Brig Arnold. Um, and this was a ship that got stuck in Plymouth Harbor in the winter and um, it, it it was just a horrific um, episode where the sailors froze to death um, and the people of Plymouth uh, couldn't do anything to help them because they just couldn't get out to the ship and bring them on shore. And so um, there are some pretty horrific um, records of, of what happened when they finally did get to the ship and find um, these poor men. But they are buried in a mass grave on Burial Hill, those sailors who died. And um, so there was some uh, ground penetration penetrating radar that was used to try to locate their um, their grave. And um, I will also say that one of the, um, you know, one of the areas of Burial Hill, what we know was reserved for, to, um, for the burial, burial of um, people who, you know, impoverished people or um, African Americans. Um, and so th that area doesn't have gravestones or as many headstones because, um, you know, the people couldn't afford them. And so it's most likely, you know, sort of more of a pauper grave. And that's also something that people would be interested in, in uncovering. So there hasn't been a complete um, ground penetrating radar study done of the hill, but that's something that in, in certain areas they are trying to um, discover. Um, and then another question that's sort of similar to this, um, do we know how many buildings were on Burial Hill before it was used for burials? So this is a great question because um, we actually don't think there were building, buildings on Burial Hill other than that, than the Fort House. And the, because the hill was, was elevated, it was a great place to build a fort so you could see out to the harbor and be aware if there were any, any, any enemy vessels that came in. Um, it was a great 
place of defense. Um, but in terms of actually building houses, you usually avoided building houses on hills in colonial New England. Um, and so for, for most of its history, Burial Hill was actually used as a burial ground. So even though, um, again, we don't have stones before 1681, but we do, we, we think that those burials were taking place there, even though they're no, they, we don't have those markers anymore. Um, but we do know that there were, um, the, the pastor of the, the church was actually given permission to use Burial Hill as a grazing um, place. So, um, you know, it was um, basically just, just even though there were graves on there, uh, until quite, quite late in its history, you know, um, you could have sheep just wandering the hill and um, grazing. And we also know that there were houses built along the side of Burial Hill. So at what I mentioned School Street earlier, and that actually did have a school building on it. There were livery stables um, along School Street as well. So there, there were more um, buildings at the base of Burial Hill, but not, not at the top other than the fort. Um, and one question was, why did burying stop there in the 1950s? Um, and basically, burying stopped in Burial Hill in the 1950s because it was, it was full. Um, and I'll talk in a minute about some of Plymouth's other burying grounds, but there really wasn't that much space left. And actually, there aren't that many burials from the 1950s. Um, the people who, are, who were buried there in the 1950s were buried in family plots where they still had space. Um, but most, um, mo most burials by that time had moved to, um, to, to other parts of, the, uh, of town. So, um, so, so there we have it. We have this transition um, from the winged skull to the soul effigy. And um, it's something that you can take note of, you know, and again, if you're visiting other Harlow family graves outside of Plymouth, you're going to see a lot of the same um, iconography on gravestones, so you can um, pay attention to it. Um, I'll mention too that John Harlow's grave is not protected by granite, and you can see on um, the shoulders, we call these shoulders of graves, um, th uh, that it, those have been completely worn away. The slate has, has fallen off in chunks there. Thankfully, you can still see his um, his inscription pretty clearly. I think the stone has been cleaned fairly recently, um, but you can see where some of the slate has has chipped off. So if we move on then to the fourth generation of Harlow's on Burial Hill, I've just highlighted a few of them. Um, and the fourth generation, again, so the third generation are all sons of Samuel, the eldest surviving son of Sergeant William. Um, the fourth generation on Burial Hill, they're all sons of William or John. So it's, it's again, it's very clear that um, the, the branches, the branch of the Harlow family that stays in Plymouth and has the, the Plymouth property, they're the ones that are, um, whose lines are buried on Burial Hill. Um, so it's, it's uh, you know, sort of interesting to trace how the division of land, you know, again, obviously determined where people lived and where ultimately they were buried. Um, so the sons who uh, went off to Middlebury and had uh, land in Middleborough, um, they're buried there. Their descendants are buried there. Um, Seth Harlow died in 1802. So his stone is now bringing us into the 19th century, although it is um, still made of slate. Um, and unfortunately, this is a good example of a stone that is a little bit harder to read. Um, it has been cleaned, but um, previously to being cleaned, it had a lot of lichen on it. Um, and when you remove lichen, often it does, um, you know, even though you remove it, it can leave some discoloration of the stone. Um, so we think of it, oh, it's just a, a plant growing on a rock. How can a plant <laughs> hurt a rock? And actually, it can cause um, some damage. Um, um, so you can see that it's, this carving is a little bit, it's, it's less um, deeply carved, so it's, it's more susceptible to that erosion over time from rain and wind. Um, but this is really a lovely um, soul effigy where you, again, it's not a winged skull, it is a winged um, head, and actually you see the shoulders there too. So this is much more of, of, more of an, an angel or a cherub. Um, you know, a little bit more, more uh, friendly, um, and again, more hopeful. That's the idea that this is, this is an image of the soul of the person who's buried here, who, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a proclamation in some ways that they were a Christian believer, and so their soul 
it will be resurrected um, at, at the last, it will be resurrected um, at the last day. So this is Seth Harlow. Um, Samuel Harlow was another um, fourth generation um, Harlow on Burial Hill, and um, he died in 1767. So you're seeing, um, and again, uh, it's very similar to some of the other stones we've seen with, with this, um, the soul effigy there. Um, I think it's really fascinating if you um, browse through New England gravestones, you do see a variety um, in the even if it's the same type of motif, um, they're carved very differently because of course stone carvers were, um, were artists and they were creating something um, to be, um, you know, creating something based on maybe a motif or a model or, or you know, a typical uh, design, but they're using their own skill and their own creativity to, to shape it. Um, so you sometimes have carvings that are very poorly done. <laughs> sometimes you have car carvings that are very finely done. Um, and, it, it, and sometimes it could be done by the same carver and maybe the family had more money to pay for a gravestone. So um, the, the product they got was a little bit better. Um, the size of gravestones uh, matters. So if you, again, you, it's not a direct correlation to wealth, just because someone has a smaller gravestone, you don't want to assume that they were less wealthy. But if someone has a really big gravestone, you know that their family had, had, could afford it. Um, so this is a slate gravestone, again, Samuel Harlow. And here is John Harlow, who's also in that fourth generation. He died in 1780. And um, what I'll just make a note here of, of John, unfortunately, he also has that soul effigy or the cherub um, at the top of his stone, but you can see that um, the face of the cherub has completely fallen off. Um, and you can see this large crack down the middle of the stone. Um, you can see how the shoulders of the stone have chunks of slate that have just, um, again, disintegrated, fallen off. Um, and so this, this stone is very hard to read. Um, and it is, um, you know, it's unfortunate because it probably was a very impressive slate stone when it was first erected. Um, it looks like that, you know, that beautiful cherub space was, was well done. Um, it's just it hasn't survived as well. And that's also, um, you know, one thing to note about gravestones is that, uh, you know, even though they're all exposed to the same elements, um, the stones themselves are different. And so some slate actually does hold up better than other slate. And so you might say, well, why is this stone from, you know, 1770? Why does this stone look terrific and this one from 1804 you you can't read it how you know how did that happen and it really depends on materials um, and not all slate is going to give you the same durability um, as as other slate um, and so it could be that this particular stone that was used for John Harlow's grave, um, maybe it was just, you know, an inferior slate. And of course, at the time, um, I don't think the stone carvers would necessarily have known what was going to last longer than, um, than you know, than, than some others. Um, certainly, there were different um, quarries in uh, Massachusetts that were well known for being uh, producers of slate. So um, we have some, that's sort of where stone carving uh, centers pop up where there are where there is an, a natural supply of slate um, and uh, it's, it's so it's interesting to see how um, some scholars can actually you know there are studies that have been done on um, how many uh, stones in Burial Hill were carved by uh, different, um, you know, John Tribble had a large gravestone carving um, studio. So how many stones did he carve that are now on Burial Hill? Um, and some of them are signed and some of them are um, identified by probate records. So if someone um, paid, paid a stone carver to um, carve a stone for a de deceased family member, sometimes there's a receipt or a mention of that um, expense that was being paid out of the estate of the deceased person. So there's um, a lot of really rich information that you can track down about where these stones came from. Um, so that's uh, the end of the third generation, or excuse me, the fourth generation of Harlow's on Burial Hill. Um, and I'm just going to highlight 
two more stones um, from the fifth generation. So again, this is not an exhaustive um, inventory of Harlow gravestones on Burial Hill because there, there's so many of them um, that it, it would be really difficult to show all of them to you in one presentation. But I, I picked these two in particular because they're connected um, to other um, properties in town. So this is the JB's Harlow stone. Um, again, unfortunately, this is a stone that's severely damaged. Um, so you can see that it's it's really almost impossible to know who's buried here. Again, thankfully, we have uh, records of inscriptions of stones that were done in the 19th century. So those um, records survive and it, it, can, it can sometimes tell us something about a stone that is no longer legible. Um, but this was, um, he lived, he was a captain um, in the Revolutionary War. He was, um, um, or excuse me, um, wrong, wrong Harlow. I'll get to that in a minute. Um, he was, but he was a captain, just not in the Revolutionary War. Um, but he died in 1773. Um, and one, um, one, the reason I'm highlighting him is because his, um, house is actually um, still actually still survives, um, and so this is a how a picture of um, the his house today, which is known as the Harlow Bishop House, um, and it's on Summer Street um, right now. But this house has actually moved, um, and so I have some photos from the Antiquarian Society's um, archival collection, um, where you can see this was the um, the Harlow Bishop House in the process of being moved. Um, and I think this is uh, this is a slide that was taken during the 1960s redevelopment of the Summer Street High Street area. Um, so High Street was the street um, right south of Burial Hill. It connected. If you if you're familiar with Plymouth, if you um, are standing in Town Square and you're looking at the, um, the the stone meeting house, if you went to the left of the meeting house, you there is now. Um, uh, the the parish house for the first parish church um, and you can sort of walk past their their building and past their parking lot um, and you'll that's that's what was high street and all of the houses there were demolished in the 1960s in the name of urban renewal and um, Plymouth went through this massive redevelopment um, and many of the houses on summer street were also torn down so these are 18th century early 19th century houses um, the justification was that the this was um, that they were they were in poor condition and that they were a hazard to um, have you know to leave standing um, and unfortunately they 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 the whole communities were wiped out and often they were um, communities of um, you know sort of minorities within Plymouth that were that were being um, moved and instead of having these historic streets with historic houses you now have um, the Spring Street apartments uh, which were were built to to fill this this area um, and so there were a few houses that were saved from demolition they were um, judged to be either in good enough condition that they could be moved and restored or they were of, you know, and, and they also were of historic value. And so the Harlow Bishop House was one of those houses that was moved. And you'll see in this photograph that um, if you look behind the house, um, you can actually see Burial Hill and you'll see um, that um, there are, you can sort of make out some gravestones and there aren't that many trees there. Um, there are a few trees, but certainly not as much, not as many as we have today. So even since, um, you know, the, the 20th century, those trees have grown up. So this is um, the Harlow Bishop House in its new location on Summer Street. Um, and this, um, where this, this meadow is right here in the foreground, this will soon be um, torn up and it will be the location of the John Carver Inn and then those Spring Street apartments. Um, so this was a, a massive undertaking in Plymouth. Um, Plymouth received federal money, urban renewal money to um, complete this project. And um, unfortunately, I think uh, most people today think that it was a um, an unfortunate choice that that we wish that um, they had been able to save those historic neighborhoods to save those 18th and 19th century buildings. Um, but um, we can't turn back the clock. So that's what happened. And we're thankful that the Harlow Bishop House was saved um, and relocated. And I, I brought it up because it is actually um, 
now operating as as a rental home. So if you look, you know, if you search Harlow House in Plymouth, you'll come up with the our Harlow House on Sandwich Street. You'll probably get a, a hit for the um, the William Harlow House on um, Winter Street, which we talked about on Friday. And then you'll you'll probably get a hit for this house because it is advertising itself as a as a BNB as a rental property. Um, and then the other house that you'll probably come across was actually the um, Jesse Harlow house. And so to go back to Burial Hill, um, we have here um, a row of gravestones. And again, you can see from this photograph the um, Cushman Memorial, the obelisk in the back. Um, there. So that help, hopefully helps to orient you a little bit. If you were on Burial Hill, um, you just walk up this small path um, um, off of the Cushman Memorial and you'd come to a row of Harlow family graves. Um, and they are the graves of Captain Jesse Harlow. And he is the, the captain I was thinking of who, who was in the American Revolution, which is why his grave is marked with a, um, uh, a flag here. And unfortunately, again, his gravestone is very hard to read. It has um, heavy lichen on it. The carving is done very finely and very lightly. So it's, um, it's, it's, just, it's just become very difficult to read. But I wanted to show you this um, uh, blown up detail of the uh, top of his stone because it shows um, a new another type of iconography that is used in New England graveyards and really graveyards across the country too. Um, so at the top, the very top, you see a winged face, again that soul effigy or, or, or cherub, um, and here you see this new um, symbol that we haven't talked about before. This is an urn, um, and at the top of the urn, it almost looks, you can almost see a tiny little flame coming right out of the top. And that, um, this is, the urn becomes a symbol of, of mourning. Um, it's actually hearkening all the way back to the classical period, to ancient Rome, um, where um, uh, people were cremated and their ashes were kept in urns. Now, um, no one on Burial Hill, or at least not in this period, were people being cremated. That was considered a pagan practice. It would not have been done. Um, but you, you do still have this urn being used as a classical symbol of death and of mourning. Um, and you, it's kind of interesting because in some ways you're moving away from that uh, sort of more Christian worldview or Christian presentation of death and you now have this classical image. Um, but it's not completely alienated from that Christian worldview because that flame at the top, um, which I mentioned you can see, um, right here um, that actually is some people call it like the like the the breath of life or the it, it's it's also sort of a, a soul a symbol of the soul um, and that that the soul is a flame that is not um, you know it's it's it won't go out sometimes people call it oops let me go back a spirit puff and the idea there is that you know it's this puff of the spirit that comes out of the ashes of the deceased and and then um, you know rises to heaven and lives on so that there is yes there is um, physical death as represented by the urn but then there is that spiritual rebirth um, and you also see that there's this um, drapery that's hanging over the urn and often um, you know heavy drapes um, were or, or cloth put over coffins um, that that was again a symbol of mourning so this this stone is very large um, and it's it's very beautifully done if I wish you could see it. I wish I could see it when it had been new because it must have been, again, very, very impressive. Um, it shows the status of the, um, of the person who's buried there. Um, and buried with um, Captain Jesse Harlow or his, his two wives. So he was um, a, one of his wives predeceased him and he married a second time. So I just wanted to highlight this is the, um, the grave of his wife, Elizabeth. And she has a very similar stone to her husband, so it's likely that they were purchased at the same time or that they hired the same um, uh, carver to, to do them because they wanted them to match. Um, uh, the photograph on the left is actually what the stone looks like today. You can see that there, are, there, there again, there's some lichen, there's some um, other botanical growth on there. The stone, the picture on the right shows the stone probably about six years ago. 
um, when it had been recently cleaned. And you can see how much, um, how it's, it's much easier to read um, because it's been cleaned, the lichen was removed. Um, but unfortunately, gravestone conservation is a never ending um, task because you might clean a stove, uh, clean a stone <laughs> um, one year and it, um, you know, unless you sort of keep up with it and make sure that the, the you're keeping that lichen growth um, at bay, um, over time it, it just comes back and then you have to clean it again. Um, and, and unfortunately, we mentioned the trees earlier and trees are beautiful. It's lovely to have shade on Burial Hill when you're out walking or doing a tour. Um, but trees, of course, uh, you know, help um, moisture stay on those stones. And so um, lichen loves shady spots because then they're, they're nice shady, damp spots and they can just grow. And so a lot of stones, you might see a stone that, that gets exposed to a lot of sunlight and it would have a lot less lichen than a stone that's under a tree and it's con constantly, you know, having that shade and having more moisture um, on it. So that's, that's sort of, uh, you know, just a, just a, just another challenge of, of gravestone conservation. Um, and so I mentioned Jesse Harlow had a second wife, um, and this is, um, it, here, here is her stone, and show, so she, um, she was actually um, his widow, so she survived him. And um, I tend to think that probably um, since Elizabeth died first, probably uh, her gravestone was made. Um, and then when uh, Jesse himself died, he wanted his gravestone to match her gravestone. Um, and then when uh, Sarah died, and she died quite um, a number of years after he did, um, she actually has, a, has just a, a very different style of stone. And I wanted to highlight this, highlight this because um, we have another symbol here at the top of the stone. Um, again, this stone has been cleaned. So the stone, the photograph on the left is from probably six years ago, um, and you can read it much more easily. This, the photograph on the right was taken this, this week, and you can see that we do have some lichen that's grown back. Um, but this is a new motif. Um, we mentioned the urn earlier as a symbol of mourning from the classical period, um, and paired with it is this weeping willow. And so the willow is, is often used on gravestones, again, to convey mourning. Um, and so what we have by the early 19th century is, is the shift um, towards, you know, we talked in the beginning about um, the memento mori, the gravestone is there to remind you that you will die just like this person has died and your body will go back to dust. Um, and by the 19th century, we have these more classical symbols. Um, and the, this, the focus starts to shift towards the people who remain. So instead of thinking about the person who died, you have these symbols of mourning because now the, the the, and the emphasis is on um, maybe the, the feeling of those who's, who, who have been bereaved. Um, and it's true with the inscriptions. So often you'll have epitaphs on gravestones. You might have a verse that um, talks about someone's virtue um, that you know, hi highlights their, um, their, their, their Christian life and all of the things they, that they did that were good and honorable, holding them up as a um, someone who should be um, you know, emulated. Um, but we also often now start to see in the 19th century um, verses that talk about the bereaved and how, um, you know, this, this woman who buried, who, who's buried here was the most dearly beloved mother or wife or daughter, um, and the verse will be about missing them. Um, so you have, you, again, you have these interesting shifts in how people are looking at death and then using certain types of iconography and certain, certain language um, to convey those thoughts. And so I will mention here too, um, if you look at just the beginning of the inscription on Sarah's stone, it's to the memory of. And a lot of the earlier stones that we looked at, I didn't highlight it then, but it, it, they said things like, here lies the body. Um, and, and that's a very physical statement. Here lies the body. The body of this person is in the ground right here and this grave marks it. Um, whereas here on this stone, this 19th century stone, it's to the memory of. Um, so instead of focusing on physical death, you're, again, you're thinking about memorializing the person um, and you're thinking about it within the context of the living who are remembering them and grieving them. 
Um, so that's that's a that's a little uh, taste of Burial Hill. And again, I, I highlighted Captain Jesse Harlow um, because uh, he has a house that still survives in Plymouth. There are actually a lot of Harlow family houses in Plymouth, um, but most of them are just not as widely known because they're private residences. Um, this house is at um, North Green Street, right off of the training green in downtown Plymouth. And it is a private re residence, but it used to be a bed and breakfast. So again, I'm always, I always wanna make sure people know that sometimes if they're looking for the Harlow house, um, this one might pop up because it was um, for many, many years a bed and breakfast. And um, you know, obviously it was being advertised as the Captain Jesse Harlow house in Plymouth. Um, so again, someday we'll have to sort of do um, a presentation on, on all the other Harlow houses that are in Plymouth that have Harlow connections because there's a lot of them. Um, so I'm going to move on then because um, one, um, one thing that as I was preparing this presentation, I, I realized, well, you know what, they're actually there are a lot of Harlows on Burial Hill, but as I mentioned, there are a lot of Harlows who are in these other communities, in Carver, in Middleborough, in Plimpton, in Kingston, in Duxbury, um, really in Bridgewater, there's a Harlow Cemetery. So as the family left Plymouth, um, you know, you can, you can trace the different lines in these other communities. And even within Plymouth, Harlow's didn't just stay where the Harlow house is, where are the 1677 Harlow houses. You know, that went to one line of the family. You know, certainly a lot of Harlow's stayed in the downtown area, whether they were, um, you know, they were, they were sea captains or merchants or store owners, and they, they stayed right down there. Um, but a lot of Harlow's spread out from the downtown. And Plymouth has a number of um, smaller villages and smaller areas where there were settlements in previous um, years. Often we sort of lose track of them because, um, you know, the way that the town has exploded in population in, in recent years, um, you know, it's, it's less um, organized around these specific centers. But I wanted to highlight that we, so here's a map that where you can see Burial Hill is on this map. Um, and then we have um, close to Burial Hill, right um, in downtown Plymouth, between Summer Street and Samoset Street is um, what we call Plymouth's Rural Cemetery. So even though it's, it's built quite close to the downtown, it was a planned cemetery built in the 19th century, the 1840s. Um, and the idea was to create more of a park-like setting um, with um, planned plantings of flowers, trees, um, different shrubs, um, to create more of a, a, a place where people could go and, and um, remember people and have have a peaceful experience. Um, so it was a planned cemetery as opposed to a sort of a churchyard graveyard. Um, but that, that cemetery on Summer Street is called Oak Grove and then its neighboring twin cemetery right next to it is Vine Hills. So there are Harlow's buried there. And um, we talked a little bit earlier about how the last burial in Burial Hill was in 1957. And so um, most people, you know, beginning in the 1840s, most people in Plymouth were actually being buried in Oak Grove and Vine Hills because those were the new cemeteries. They do have some older sections because burials are still happening there. So again, you have, um, it's really a wonderful place to explore because you have some really fascinating older stones. You have 18th century stones there that predated the creation of this, um, you know, planned cemetery, um, but you do you do have stones right up to the present. Um, and then I wanted to highlight Chiltonville is one of the villages of Plymouth south of um, the downtown area. Chiltonville, there's a larger cemetery there where there are a lot of Harlow's buried. Um, and then a lot of Harlow's actually settled in the Manomet area of Plymouth. Um, so again, just further south on Route 3A. Um, and so there is Whitehorse Cemetery. Um, and then there is um, the Manomet Cemetery itself. So those are two places to look uh, if you're looking for Harlow connections. Um, there's a much smaller cemetery in the western part of town in South Pond. The South Pond Cemetery um, is very small. It's one of these cemeteries that is sort of um, almost, you know, lost in the woods, so to speak. Um, but there are some Harlows there. And then also, if you go all the way down, almost until you're out of Plymouth, you go down to the village of Ellisville. 
Um, and that is where there is what's actually called the Harlow Cemetery. Um, and sometimes it's also called the Ellisville Cemetery. Um, but Ellisville, the, there was um, a branch of the Harlow family that lived in Ellisville. And then the Ellis family was also one of the more um, uh, in just one of the families that was also in that area. Um, so those, those two families have a lot of graves in the Harlow Cemetery, but it's a cemetery that you could easily miss. It's on Old Sandwich Road, which is a dirt road, and um, it's, it's just very small, but um, there are some interesting graves there. So moving along, um, I did receive a question um, when, when you all were registering for the reunion, um, we did, you know, I, I did offer, if anyone had any questions, I could try to, to look them up and answer them. And we did have um, a question about um, a specific Harlow line. Um, and this was Sandra actually um, asked this question, but um, she noted that her grandmother left her a note that about where some of her um, ancestors were buried. Um, and so these, this grave is actually in, um, um, uh, it's actually in um, the cemetery that I mentioned earlier, Vine Hills. So it's not, it's not on Burial Hill, um, but it is in that um, other cemetery in downtown Plymouth, Vine Hills. Um, and you'll see that the, the family stone says Keith, um, but you'll note, and again, this is, this is a granite stone, but it's actually hard to read because it too has lichen on it. Um, but there are no numbers of Harlow's buried here. So there's Erastus Harlow, and then on the back of that same stone, you have Charles, um, Charles S. Harlow. So Charles um, S. Harlow was the son of Erastus Harlow, and they are both buried um, or memorialized here in Vine Hill Cemetery. Um, so again, that's if you're looking for um, specific um, family lines, I'll, I'll mention at the end how you might be able to find them, find if they're buried in Plymouth. Um, I, as, as I mentioned in, on Friday, I am a Harlow descendant. And so I, I, I thought I'd just share a gravestone from the White Horse Cemetery down in Manomet, um, which again, this is a tiny, tiny cemetery. It's, it's incredibly, I think it's, it's quite lovely. There are beautiful cedar trees there. It's um, um, very shady, which is nice for visiting, not nice for gravestone conservation, um, but it's, it's right off of a cul-de-sac. So there are all these private houses on this cul-de-sac, and then there's a, there's a right-of-way that leads into this town cemetery um, called White Horse Cemetery, and um, this is where there are a number of Harlow's buried, um, and I, my Harlow family line comes through Jerusha Mori, who was a Harlow, so she was the daughter of Isaac Harlow, who was the son of Robert Harlow, the son of William, the son of Sergeant William. Um, so this is how my Harlow line comes down through the Maury's. Um, and she was, as you can see, she was born, well, she doesn't have her date. She was born in 1759 and she died in 1848 and her husband was Cornelius Maury. Um, and so they're buried there. There are other, there are a lot of Bartlett's in this cemetery because a lot of the, the Bartlett line um, actually um, was in Manomet. So if you're looking for Bartlett's, um, you might find a lot of them here. And I will note um, this gravestone looks very different from the ones that we saw on Burial Hill. It is made of marble um, and it's that mid 19th century marble stone that um, you know, would have been beautiful when first put up because it would have been brilliantly white. Um, gravestone carvers loved marble because it was a softer stone. It was really easy to carve. But unfortunately, because it's a softer stone, it erodes much. Um, it, it's, it's even more um, delicate than slate is. Um, so this stone is, is an example of a mid 19th century marble stone. Um, and often in cemeteries, you'll see marble stones that will just be plain um, rectangular shapes like, like this one is. And I'll show you, this is just a shot, a photograph of, of that White Horse Cemetery so you can get a sense for it. Um, it you know, it, if the town didn't own it, it's quite likely that it would just be lost to time and the trees and bushes would grow, grow over the stones and you, would, um, you wouldn't know it was there. And there are a lot of family stone, uh, family plots 
um, you know, in, in New England communities that um, have done just that. They've disappeared to, um, to those of us who, who might want to find the gravestones. But if, if there was a farm, a family farm, and they had a family graveyard on the farm or on their private property, it, um, in most cases, those, you know, those small gravestone, graveyards have been just, just um, overcome and overgrown. So if anyone has has knows of um, family plots like that, you know, it, it would be wonderful to share that information so that it could be documented um, and that they aren't lost to future uh, generations. I also wanted to highlight, we had a question about, um, Barbara actually asked about um, Harlow Family Cemeteries in Maine. Um, and so I wanted to, to highlight that, again, Find a Grave is a wonderful resource. Um, it is, again, you always have to check Find a Grave because you might have um, someone who goes and looks for a particular gravestone and they might be wrong about how that person is connected to other people. Um, so you always have to double check the genealogy. But um, there are a lot of really wonderful volunteers who are going into these smaller graves, graveyards and photographing the memorials and um, uh, transcribing the inscriptions so that you at least have a record of, of who's buried in that cemetery. And so I did look, um, Barbara, I did look up um, the Harlow Cemetery. Um, there are, are a couple of them in Androscoggin County in Maine. Um, and if you um, look up on Find a Grave and you just Google Harlow Cemetery, um, you will find Harlow Cemeteries in, you know, of course, in Plymouth, you'll find one in Bridgewater, which is a town close to here. You'll You'll find this one in Maine, you'll find some in Alabama, you'll find them really across the country. Of course, you then would have to know who you're looking for and how they might be related to um, Sergeant William Harlow, and they might not be related to Sergeant William Harlow. So you just, you always have to, you know, be, be doing your own genealogical work as you go. But I did want to mention that there are graves, th those graves in this particular Harlow Cemetery have been transcribed, um, if you'd like to, to look them up. Um, and so, so as we wrap up this part of the presentation, I did want to highlight that, um, and I will make sure these slides are shared so you can um, refer to them later, um, but the town of Plymouth really has a wonderful burial search database. So um, when you get the slides, you can um, use this web link um, to go directly to the town of Plymouth Cemetery Department site where you can search by um, last name, last and first name um, for any, anyone who might be buried in Plymouth. Um, and so, and often if they know where the gravestone is, they actually might give you GPS coordinates to that gravestone. So a lot of the graves in Burial Hill, they actually do have the coordinates too. And you can, you know, can type in Harlow, Jesse, um, you know, and select the year he died. And then you'll be taken to um, a little map that will show you where his grave is. And then also it will, it often, there'll be photographs of those graves. So the town of Plymouth has been done, has been doing some conservation work on Burial Hill um, and they've been documenting as they go. Um, but the town of Plymouth burial search is not just Burial Hill. The beauty of it is that if you don't know where a Harlow might be buried in Plymouth, you can use that and it will search all of the Plymouth burial records. So again, it's not false proof that, you know, that there, there definitely could be graves that aren't documented, that have sort of been lost in the mists of time. Um, but if there is a record of a grave that survives, you should be able to find it using um, this burial search feature. So even that small graveyard at Whitehorse Cemetery, those graves are in here. So you can, you can look for them there. Um, the other thing I wanted to point out was that we, the Antiquarian Society does offer um, tours of Burial Hill in, um, in, in better conditions when we don't have to be socially distant. Um, and so this spring and summer, we've been offering them with the Pilgrim Society as um, virtual tours. So on our website, you can go um, and you can find those virtual tours if you'd like to sort of see what else is out there. It's a, it's a, a themed history tour on the, usually the first Saturday of every month. Um, and then the final link is actually um, will take you to a digital copy of a survey done in the 1990s 
of Burial Hill, and it um, was done by the Robinson family. Uh, it was published by the Plymouth Public Library Corporation, and it has an incredible wealth of information. So they, what they tried to do is go through Burial Hill and document every single stone that was there. Um, they also um, checked their records, their survey against the 19th century um, surveys that had been done. So they, if they could, they would try to identify which stones are no longer on Burial Hill because they've been you know, unfortunately removed or destroyed or, um, or illegible. Um, so, so it's really just a terrific resource, um, provides you with a lot of great information um, and can help you find the stones. And I would say that I'm always happy um, since I'm here in Plymouth, um, you know, if there's a specific stone that you're looking for and you look it up and you say, um, and I'm looking for the grave of, um, you know, Elizabeth Harlow, who died in 1775, and I found, you know, a reference to it. Could you take a photograph of it for me? I'd be more than happy to take a photograph of it if I can find it <laughs> of, and send it so you have a record of it. Um, I would even try, you know, I'm, I'm in Middleborough quite a lot, so if you, you um, look at the uh, the cemetery at the green there and you have Harlow's in there that you'd like photographed, I can probably help you with that as well. But um, but certainly with Plymouth gravestones, um, I, I would try to, to help you um, find whoever you're looking for. Um, so let me go back to the questions because we've had a lot coming through. Um, so um, let me just... Um, Probably I'll just go through them and, and we might be jumping around a lot because I know we've been talking about a lot of different topics. So it could be that um, uh, questions were sparked in your mind. Um, so Lori was asking about why there weren't other houses from that era, um, the 17th century, I think, preserved in Plymouth. And that's a great question. And um, I think the, the, the short answer is just that, you know, you don't preserve something until enough time has gone by where you think, oh, this should be preserved. In most cases, um, you know, the 17th century um, colonists are building houses because they need places to live. Their children move into them, uh, live in them, re, re, you know, redo them, renovate them, um, expand them, um, and, and they're not really thinking this is a historic structure because it's not a historic structure. Um, it's, it's their home. And so it continues to be passed down. And um, houses, you know, generally speaking, were, um, you know, they, they were often they were uh, re reused for different purposes. Sometimes they were moved. Um, you know, maybe a house that's not being used anymore might be moved and repurposed as a barn or something like that. So um, there was less of a, um, you know, here's a house and now we're going to tear it down and build a new house. So the other issue that happens is that a lot of these older houses are sort of buried within the newer houses. So, and that's one thing I mentioned with that, uh, the Harlow House on Winter Street in Plymouth, a lot of people think that maybe the 17th century house is buried within the 18th century house, but um, it's just, you know, well, people were building houses and living in them and changing them all the time. Um, I will say the other challenge in Plymouth in particular is that often it's the sites of the pilgrims that are preserved as opposed to other early families in Plymouth. Um, and so that's one thing that for the Antiquarian Society, we feel that it's it's not just about the pilgrim story, we're, we're preserving the Plymouth story, um, but a lot of, you know, the Howland house was preserved by the Howland family. And so really the first, um, the earliest preservation movement in the United States kicks off with the preservation of Mount Vernon, the home of George Washington in Virginia, and that um, kicks off right around the time of the Civil War. Um, and so that's really the first historic house um, that's preserved for um, you know, as a museum because it seemed to be valuable. Um, and so that early preservation movement in the 19th century, they're concerned with the houses of, um, you know, these, these again, George Washington and John Adams and Thomas Jefferson, um, big names in American history. Um, and it's really only until later, um, really into the 20th century that people start saying, well, no, it's not just, um, we don't just want to preserve the homes of these, um, these, these big names, we want to preserve 
serve the homes of everyday people. And if a historic house still exists, then um, then let's preserve it. Um, so that's um, we do have you know in terms of 17th century houses in Plymouth that are preserved as museums. There is that the Howland House, as I mentioned, and there is the Sparrow House. Um, but both of those houses changed over the years because they were inhabited for so many um, decades. And um, so what's being preserved today is really um, a product of the restorations that happened in those houses in the 1930s. So just like the Harlow House was restored by Joseph Everett Chandler, um, he and other um, architects and historians like him also restored the uh, Howland House and the Sparrow House in Plymouth. Um, so you, you have those homes that have, have been preserved but probably have also been um, transformed a lot too. Um, so I hope so that is a good question though. Um, uh, all right. So um, I think we have another question from Julie about what was an early pilgrim funeral like? Um, and uh, so pilgrim funerals, this is a great question. Um, they were they were pretty um, uneventful, I, I would say. Um, it, it, you know, pilgrim burials were in plain wooden coffins um, you would you know we do there are some resources and I can actually share those out um, you know historians who have done research on this and um, you know it's believed they were just wrapped in plain uh, linen shrouds and buried in plain wooden boxes um, and there would not have been a lot of um, you know, there wouldn't have been sort of any sort of grand memorials or uh, singing, um, dancing, anything, anything like that. Um, it would have been um, a pretty short um, committal to the ground um, in keeping with that idea of um, this is the body um, the, and, um, you know, the, the Christian idea of, of the uh, return of the body to dust. Um, so that's, that's um, one thing we know about pilgrim burials. Um, and I, I'll share, I'll, I think I have some sources that I can share with you on that um, um, via email. But we do know, of course, that um, probably the earliest burials by the pilgrims in Plymouth were actually done on Coles Hill and not Burial Hill. So Coles Hill is the, um, the large hill across from Plymouth Rock. Um, and we think in the first winter, that's where the, um, you know, the first dead were buried. Um, and then it was, you know, after after the colony was a little more established, they, they start using Burial Hill um, or Fort Hill as it was called. So um, a lot of those first um, burials were done um, very quickly and quietly um, and they probably were not marked as graves. Okay, so um, I'm just going through the question. Okay, we have a question about, is there a high tech way to read a stone that has severely deteriorated? Um, I would say it's, it's, it's still amazing what different lights can do. Um, so if you go, if you are looking for a particular stone and you're able to um, get it at a good, at a good light, um, you sometimes can read it quite, quite well if the sun is hitting it just at the right angle. So of course, sometimes you can also bring your own light and try to, um, you know, cast a raking light that will um, help to make the inscription pop a little bit more. Um, I would say that, um, you know, you do not by never <laughs> should you rub a gravestone. That was something that, um, you know, a lot of people used to do. You'd take your paper and you'd rub on it um, in order to get that, that trace, that pattern, and that actually can help, you know, accelerate the deterioration of the gravestone. So you don't want to try to do that. Um, but if you use um, lighting to take a better photograph, if you can then enhance the photograph, um, that's a, probably a better way of doing it. And again, on Burial Hill at least, and a lot of other cemeteries, there were earlier surveys that did transcribe inscriptions. So it's always good, I think, before taking drastic measures to go back to those earlier sources and see if they can help you read it um, a little bit better. Um, all right, one of, the, one of the questions, what are the most recent Harlow graves up there on Burial Hill? Um, descends of who still live in town and married into pilgrim families. Exactly, there are certainly a lot of um, Harlow descendants still in Plymouth and um, still a lot of them still um, 
you know, are, are probably being buried in, in Vine Hills and um, Cemetery and, in, um, and probably down in Manomet and other cemeteries that are still active. So I can't tell you what the most recent grave is. I do know that um, uh, a woman named Cora Harlow was buried on Burial Hill with her husband, Fred Jenks. Um, and I think they died in the 1940s. Um, so I do know of her um, gravestone, but I don't know if there was anyone after her. Um, but that's a great question. Um, and we could certainly, if someone is, is looking for someone, we could certainly try to um, try to find them. Um, so we, there's a question about, are you able to tour the house? And so the, um, the Jesse Harlow house and the Jabez, the Harlow Bishop house are not open to the public. They're private residences, although, um, the Harlow Bishop House is now, you are able to rent it. So if you, <laughs> um, if I think you have to rent the whole house, so it's probably a pretty expensive proposition because it has quite a few bedrooms. Um, but if you were looking to come to Plymouth and you wanted to stay in a Harlow house, um, you could certainly um, look and see if you were able to, to get a whole group together and see if you could rent the house. But um, the, the, um, the other, the, um, the Jesse Harlow house used to be a bed and breakfast and is no longer a bed and breakfast. So you can't stay there um, and you can't visit. I'll let you know if they ever, um, um, you know, let, let people come in for a special tour. Um, we have a question about who takes care of the area now. So Burial Hill is a town cemetery. So the town does um, take care of it. Um, and unfortunately, there, Plymouth is a very, very large town. Um, so there are a lot of cemeteries to take care of. Um, and um, there are a lot of historic gravestones that need a lot of attention. So the town has dedicated funds in recent years to doing a lot of conservation that is very badly needed. Um, but we also have a group in town called the Friends of Burial Hill. Um, it's a nonprofit organization, and usually they they work with the town to um, help with cleaning stones. Um, it's it's very closely regulated. The town um, doesn't just doesn't just let anyone go up there and and do do these projects. So um, and right now because of the COVID pandemic, the, the cemeteries have basically been closed to any kind of activities like that. Um, so that is, um, it is, the short answer is the town takes care of it, but um, they do often receive help from nonprofit organizations. Um, all right, Grace is asking if there's any way to have an international record of Harlow cemeteries done, for example, showing those descendants who moved to Nova Scotia, Canada. It's a great question. Um, and I don't, I don't really know that much about um, um, Nova Scotia cemetery records. I don't, um, I would think that probably you could um, look on find a grave and see if there are any that um, would help if you, if you knew who in particular you were looking for. Um, and, uh, but other than that, I, I would have to say, I just, I don't know, um, Grace, of any specific um, uh, place to look off the top of my head, but I could, I could try and see if I find something and then uh, I would certainly let you know. Um, that's the beauty of, of online surveys is that, um, you know, and crowdsourcing. So again, although it's not always 100% accurate, you can um, certainly, um, you know, find a lot online that, that can help with those sort of sources. Um, all right, so we have a few questions, and these are sort of related to um, the the some of the, the the items I mentioned about Whitehorse Cemetery. So Rebecca Bartlett Harlow, um, yes, I think. Um, well, a lot of the Harlow and Bartlett's I mentioned are buried in White Whitehorse Cemetery, um, or Rebecca Harlow Bartlett. I'm I'm. I think Sue, you mean Rebecca Harlow Bartlett. Um, I'm not sure. I don't think we have an extant gravestone for um, any of the first generation, so William or his wives, but I believe that their, um, um, the Bartlett's who descended through the Harlows are buried in White Horse Cemetery, so there are some, some graves for them there. Um, uh, has anyone checked the Harlow properties for fieldstone burials? So that again is um, one thing I mentioned that there can be 
private family burial grounds, grave, grave areas or fieldstone burials um, on private property. Um, as far as I know, that hasn't been done. I will say that anecdotally, um, my family <laughs> was able to visit many, many years ago, a private cemetery that was in the middle, now is just in the middle of the woods somewhere. Um, and we don't actually know how to get back to it. <laughs> the people who showed it to us, um, um, you know, didn't record that. So um, again, it's, it's in these days of, of GPS where you can actually mark where um, pretty much, you know, pinpoint exactly where something is located. It would be wonderful to go through um, and, and look for them. Um, but so, as far as I know, we haven't found any um, grave markers on the Harlow properties that are identified as Harlow properties in the downtown area. Um, okay. So let me check the chat box. Um, all right. Okay, Valerie mentioned that Jabez was married to experienced Churchill and she was descended from Peter Brown of the Mayflower. Yep, so we have, a, we have some um, Mayflower connections through some of these, um, you know, second, third, fourth, fifth generation Harlows who marry into different pilgrim lines. Um, and I think um, um, Experience was actually um, buried next to Jabez, but his was the stone that was um, in such poor condition. And I believe her stone is also in very, um, uh, in very poor condition. So it's hard to read, unfortunately. Um, so um, what, how many efforts have been made to record what's on the tombstone since they are decaying? What is the earliest date that this has been done? So it was, um, there was a gentleman named Benjamin Drew of Plymouth who actually um, went through and did record as many gravestones as he could. So he recorded inscriptions and epitaphs. Again, he didn't get all of the stones and he didn't always get them exactly right, um, but that's a wonderful um, source. And if you look on the, um, the website that I mentioned, our Plymouth Antiquarian Society burial Hill website, we do actually have um, uh, links to digital copies of both Bradford Kingman, so he was another early uh, recorder of um, Graves on Burial Hill, Bradford Kingman, and Benjamin Drew. We have um, links to free digital copies of their books, so you can look at, at those books and, and see the inscriptions in there. When that 1990s survey was done at Burial Hill, they, um, they transcribed all of the graves on Burial Hill, at least as many as they could find. And since then, um, when Friends of Burial Hill does work on Burial Hill, they document. So they take a photo, they take photographs, they um, um, create transcriptions of the of the inscriptions. And the same with the town. When the town does work, they photograph, they take down the inscriptions. Um, so the most of those graves have been very well documented. And I would say what has been less well documented are the graves in other cemeteries. So um, again, that's why find a grave is wonderful. And it's wonderful that um, it is, you know, at Plymouth Antiqua or um, excuse me, the Plymouth Public Library actually launched a campaign um, recently asking volunteers to go to Oak Grove and Vine Hills those um, other cemeteries in downtown Plymouth and to, to, to add so stones to find a grave um, because sort of it was real, we realized, well, we have all like all this information on Burial Hill, but we don't have as much information on these other graveyards, which are just as important. Um, and so more and more people are contributing to that and adding photographs and adding um, inscriptions. Again, you, you know, always want to double check if you're looking for someone in particular. Um, but I think that's something that in a lot of communities, not just here in Plymouth, but elsewhere on the South Shore, probably throughout New England, there are a lot of people who, um, you know, in the 19th century, beginning in the 19th century, felt concerned about these stones and recognized that they were deteriorating and started recording them. Or maybe they were interested in their genealogy and they wanted to record the stones so that there was a record um, of the genealogy. Um, so that's, you know, so thankfully those sources exist. And I would encourage you, if you're in a community that has a historic cemetery, you might want to check with your local library. They might have in their history room, if they have a history or a genealogy room, they might have um, a source like that where, where the um, stones have been um, transcribed. And actually there was someone um, who, who did that for a lot of the cemeteries on the South Shore. And again, maybe didn't get all the stones, but did have a, um, a, a plan to go out and um, record as many as he could. So there, those sources are out there. Um, 
So, so we have a well, we have just a, a lot of nice comments from folks who have to leave. Um, the webinar because um, I'm just checking the time. Oh, it is four o'clock. So we've gone much longer than I thought. Um, and so before we finish, I'm just going to um, share one more slide or two more slides. Because I did mention that we have at the Antiquarian Society the great privilege of having um, recently been given a sampler um, that has a Harlow connection. So this is um, here you're seeing the front of um, the sampler done on September 10th, 1818 um, by Lucia Harlow Holmes. Now I don't think she did the sampler just on September 10th. That was probably probably the date that she finished it maybe. <laughs> Samplers usually take a lot longer to, um, to produce. Um, but samplers were used by um, girls and young women in um, the 18th century and the 19th century um, as, as a way to learn important needlework skills. Uh, they were also show pieces. So um, what's fascinating is we think about um, women and girls in this period and you know it's evidence that they they knew their alphabet they knew their numbers so they're um, you know it's an evident it's, it's evidence of literacy and education um, for these um, young women uh, before potentially there were public schools or before um, you know when when girls would have been learning mostly at home or in dame schools um, we do one thing that's special about this sampler is we have the name of um, Lucia's teacher who was another Lucia, Lucia Ryder. Ryder is another um, Plymouth family name. Um, and so it's, it's not only does it have her name, it has her teacher's name, and it has her, um, her, her location, Plymouth, and the date, September 10th, 1818. Um, and then it has this um, verse at the bottom, now in the heat of youthful blood, remember your creator God. Behold, the months come haste, hastening on um, when you shall say, my joy is gone. Um, and this is, this is the type of verse that is very common on schoolgirl samplers because it's a reminder, almost like the first gravestones that we looked at and the memento mori, reminders of death. Um, often there, there are verses written by Isaac Watts and other um, Christian hymnists who are um, reminding children in particular that in their youth they need to be prepared to live um, to live the life as best they can because life is short and that um, when you're young you think your life will last forever but you have to remember that um, eventually um, the months will come when you shall say my joy is gone when 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 old age and death will come upon you and the, the reminder here is that even in the heat of youth in the you know all the the promise of, of childhood and youth you would remember God and you would be um, reminded of um, you know the desire the the, the call to obedience um, and, and to live a Christian, um, to live a Christian life. Um, so this is Lucia's sampler. Um, it's really a wonderful um, addition to our collection. We're thankful for the, um, the Harlow descendant who, who gave it to us. Um, and I'll just flip to the next slide where you can see the back of the slide. Um, or excuse me, the back of the sampler. So the sampler had been framed and you'll notice around the perimeter um, there, there's some um, paper residue where it had been glued onto the frame. Um, and we actually have, um, uh, we're working with a conservator to have this sampler conserved to remove um, this, uh, the adhesive, to remove the paper as much as can be removed without damaging it, um, and to, to do some very light cleaning. Because unfortunately, this sampler has been exposed to a lot of light, um, and light not only fades um, fabric, so it not only fades colors, but it also um, can do irreparable damage to the, the fibers themselves. So um, this is a linen-backed sampler and it's um, with silk thread. And here in the back, you can actually see that the colors, the original colors are much brighter. Um, probably even from the back, they faded, but you have these flowers that are um, orange and yellow. And if we go back to the front, you can see on the front where it's been most exposed to light, those colors have really faded into um, just this, this dull beige. Um, but there you have um, the Lucia Harlow Home Sampler, which we're excited to um, to have been given and to have um, the funds available to conserve it. Um, and that way it, it's too fragile to display regularly, but um, perhaps if um, with, with all a good hope, we hope we all hope that we'll be able to meet in person next year for the reunion. Um, and we, we should be able to share this um, at, at one of our gatherings next year. So you can see it in person 
Um, and maybe, maybe we'll be able to do some research on it <laughs> before then so that we can um, tell you a little bit more about Lucia Harlow Holmes um, and, and her family. So that, um, that is actually the end of the presentation. Um, um, da, 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 da. Oh, we did have one more question from Sandy um, about the Erastus and Charles Harlow stone, which I showed, which was in Vine Hills. Um, is there a name for the area identified by my grandmother as the old section? There's an, um, so it's sort of interesting in Vine Hills and Oak Grove. So Oak Grove and Vine Hills are technically two separate cemeteries, but they bleed into each other. Um, so there's no dividing line be between them. They're both town cemeteries and there, um, and there are still burials that take place there today. Um, so I would think that probably, um, I don't think that there are specific areas that are sort of marked out as being an old section there, but often what happens is you might have a family plot that was in an old, that was, that's a little bit older. So the burials there, burials there are older. And then maybe the family outgrew that plot and needed to buy a second plot, which they might have considered the newer section of the burial ground. Um, so it's a fascinating place to walk because you can clearly see, you know, there are sections where there are older graves and then there are sections where there are newer graves. Um, but in a, it's, I don't think there's, there's not a specific division where one section is older and one is newer. Um, um, Oak Grove, again, is, you know, it started to be a planned cemetery in the 1840s and Vine Hills came a little bit later, but there were early burials in both of those cemeteries. Um, so it was just a stretch of land uh, west of the downtown that, um, you know, was used for farming and was privately owned, but also was, was an early place for some burials. Um, so it's, it's an interesting place to visit. All right, so those, I think, are coming us to the end of our questions. Um, and, um, well, without further ado, I think I will, um, I will end there because we are at 411. So thank you all for, um, spending time with me today. I hope you enjoyed the presentation. Um, again, we'll be following up via email. I know we mentioned links to, um, some of these sources on Burial Hill and Plymouth cemeteries, um, some of the sources on Plymouth 400 and the events for next year. We'll try to share that information with you via email. And then um, hopefully we'll see you um, next year, 2021 at the Harlow House um, for the 82nd reunion. And um, thanks again to uh, Carol and the board of um, directors for inviting me to speak today. And again, you all have my email address. So feel free to email me if you have any questions that I didn't cover today. Um, um, if you're looking for a specific um, gravestone, if you're looking for a specific Harlow family member, whether they have the surname of Harlow or not, um, feel free to um, you know, email me those questions and I can try to see if I can find something that might help you. But um, have, have fun <laughs> looking for, for your, your ancestors. And um, again, I will also share out all of the email addresses to connect you with the Harlow Family Association um, board so that you'll be able to communicate directly with, um, with Carol and with Sue Painter, who is membership director, um, with Winfield Harlow, who is the genealogist, so that if you're not yet a member of the Harlow Family Association but want to join, um, you, can, you can, of course, you're more than welcome. And so um, thank you for um, joining us for the, the whole weekend and I will see you next year. So thanks so much, everyone, um, and um, take care.